minutes. Okay. So let me put a title in heart what's your heart i will copy this one what's your heart telling you yep brilliant so we're going to go live in three two one so massive thanks richard for being on board this afternoon um so let me just change over to my slides with you so um, Richard, for those of people who don't know you, uh, your your background initially was in rugby. You played at the highest level. I think you had 11 caps for Canada. Uh, your greatest triumph was playing against Ireland at the Millennium Stadium uh, in Cardiff. Um, you were also involved in rugby sevens, if I remember rightly, as well. Um, you also That's played for... I was coaching sevens. I was never a very good sevens player. But oh, I, really? I was able to tell other people what to do. <laughs> okay, so rugby sevens, and you also played for the Leicester Tigers. I know you played for London Irish as well. Yeah. Um, and according to a news article I was reading, you, you retired younger than the younger or, or, or normal age. I don't know if that's really true or not, but I think you retired about 32. Uh, I was 31, actually. Oh, well, that, that's and, close enough. And, yeah, I, I, was, I was younger than the average, uh, the average player to retire. I think when I retired, the average age was 35, maybe 34. Wow. Um, but that's for people that choose to retire, don't forget. Um, many, probably the majority, more than half, uh, are forced out of the game through either injury uh, or just not getting a contract renewed. And so I, I actually felt really quite privileged to be able to retire on my own terms. I, I'm quite surprised, Richard, um, mm. that the average age was as high as 35. I, I'm not, I would have thought it would have been a lot, lot younger. In football, you associate the average age of retirement to be younger than that. You know, when players in their 30s and if you get close to 40, mm. um, it's seen as a significant age. Yeah. And I'm delighted this afternoon. So you transitioned, I should say, from being a rugby player, rugby coach, um, working with a brother as well, um, and then moving into um, being a coach for Cognacity. I've really fast forward your last four or five years into about 15 seconds. Look, yeah. let me hand over to you, Richard. Yeah, well, you've, got, you've certainly got the highlights there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, like we were just saying, I mean, I was, I was really fortunate I chose to retire. Um, that's something that a lot of professional athletes right now are really struggling to, to get their head around. Like all of us, there's so much uncertainty with COVID-19. What's life going to look like over the next two or three weeks, let alone the next two or three months or two or three years? What, what's the long-term fallout going to be? Mm. Um, I've got friends that are still in the game really concerned about whether they're going to have a job anymore um whether their clubs clubs going to be able to afford to uh, to keep to keep them on over this period um there's been most premiership clubs have re reduced their salaries by around 25 percent um they've asked all their players to do that um for some players that's fine for for others they're really going to struggle so a great deal of uncertainty and with the, the work that cognacity are doing now we're, we're doing a lot with pro athletes and trying to help them through this through this this challenging time, um, but of course it's not just athletes; it's it's all of us, and that's ultimately what I'm here to talk about today. So, uh, yes, backgrounds pro sport, um, retired retired to move into property investment. Myself, as you mentioned, myself and my brother ran a property investment company. Uh, we still do, um, and uh, for the last two years, um, my day to day role has been as a, a performance coach or an executive coach. Um, working with top performers to help them help them squeeze that that absolute their absolute peak absolutely everything out of what they've got um cognacity deal with mental um disorders as well so we work with the whole spectrum um and that's really what we're here to talk about today 
And you're, you're based in Hardy Street, or that's where the main office for Cook Nasty is? Yeah, that's right. Um, so our, our clinical home is on Harley Street. Uh, that's where we will be dealing uh, or treating patients um, with everything from sort of mild depression and anxiety disorders um, to um, ADHD uh, to bipolar to more serious mental disorders. That that will be, be taken care of at Harley Street. Uh, I work just over the road in Wimpole Street, uh, or I'm working in clients' offices, uh, going going to see people at their uh, at their place of work or at home. Um, but that's very much on the performance end of the of the spectrum. Uh, that's working. I work with mentally well people that are, are just looking for that extra, that extra piece. Um, what's the, what, what, where's what's missing? Where's the, what's the gap, and how do we close it uh, between where they are and where they where they want to be, when they have the potential to be. Um, and for me, doing that in partnership with an organisation such as Cognacity gives gives real credibility to to what we're doing. Everything that we do is evidence based. Um, I use a, an approach referred to as cognitive behavioural coaching. Where we look at thinking and behaviour styles, um, and uh, and we we typically will um, use measurement devices and testing, um, psychometric testing, and so on, in order to validate the effectiveness of what we do. Um, so that's um, I'm actually going to explore a little bit of that today because it's actually very relevant to us managing our lifestyles during COVID nineteen. So um, what I thought we'd talk about today, and thanks again, Brendan, for the invitation to speak with you. I've, uh, over the years, whether it's been property, whether it's been performance, I've, I've always really enjoyed whenever we've done these, these calls. And uh, I, 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 I do always really appreciate it. And this is the third one we've done now. Third one, yeah. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to kind of bring, bring something tangible to, to, this, to this call and to those that have been watching. Um, what can we actually do about it? And what we're using at Cognacity now, um, and we're using this in the, the sort of elite corporate space, um, is, is looking at a measurement device whereby we can actually see the impact of our behavior and our lifestyle on our well-being and our performance. Um, really relevant right now because we've got such a marked change to our environment and to our uh, day-to-day um, activities and behaviors and our, our overall lifestyle um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how, how can we really start to refine that how can we really like tap into what's going on for us uh, is it serving us are we are we living our best self are we getting the most out of this time because let's not forget this is this is going to be over and before we know it, we're going to be turning around and some of us might turn around and say, gosh, do you know what? I got everything I could have out of that period. Uh, it's a time that we'll probably never have again in our lives. Perhaps we'll never have again in our lives. Um, for me, certainly, and for the clients that I work with, I want us turning around and saying, gosh, do you know what? I moved forward in that time. I leveled up uh, because we've got the opportunity to do that. So let's fly in. <laughs> <clears throat> so the, the, your presentations what's your heart telling you what's your heart telling you yeah um and we'll get into why that's that's a metaphor as well as a literal statement we'll get into that in a second we've already spoken about cognacity so yeah harley street institution uh, the full mental health spectrum from acute mental disorders all the way through to absolute peak performance we handle it all and i live in the performance end of the spectrum within cognacity. So, what's your heart telling you? What can we? What? What, what can we actually? How can we actually frame this in a in in a way where we can actually pull quantifiable data out of our body to 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 tell us what we do with our days? Is it serving us or not? Did the exercise that I do yesterday did that improve my fitness? How can we how can we work that out? Was my sleep last night restorative? Am I holding on to that argument that me and my partner had last night? Did it? Am I still holding that that in my body somewhere? Is it is it is it manifesting in some other way? Am I really struggling with just being at home? Um, we can actually give an answer to those questions, and the way we do that is by a phenomenon phenomenon known as heart rate variability. Now, this is probably a term that most people have come across now. It's starting to become more and more mainstream. The Apple Watch now measures 
heart rate variability, wearing a Garmin watch fitness tracker, that can measure heart rate variability. So it, it, perhaps you understand, we've heard of this concept. Uh, we abbreviate it to HRV um, for obvious reasons. Um, but what actually is it? Basically, heart rate variability is the time measured by the millisecond between consecutive heartbeats. It's the variation in that time. Beat by beat, there's a difference. If your heart rate is 60 beats per minute, that doesn't mean your heart beats once a second. There's variation. 60 beats per minute is how many times your heart beats over the course of that minute, but it doesn't mean it's beating once a second. There's these, these tiny little differentiations. So if we look at, it can either be high or it can be low. So what, is, what, what do those two mean? So a low heart rate variability, so a low variation between your heartbeats, that's like consistency to your heartbeat. If you think if you've just exercised maximally, there's like this consistent pounding of your heart, that's got a low variation. And that's indicative that your autonomic nervous system is in stress. So very simply, if you've got a low heart rate variability, your body is in a state of stress, also known as fight or flight. Now, where this can become very interesting is obviously that's useful to us in certain areas of life. And we've kind of discussed this over, I think, over our first video. Um, we spoke a bit about fight or flight and, and, uh, and so on. But we as humans now, and particularly in our day-to-day -day lifestyles, there can be activities and things that happen to us over the course of the day that engage our stress response. And we can find out when that's happening by looking at whether our heart rate variability is low or not. So important note, not all stress is bad. We've already mentioned it. Stress is important in our lives. It's how we get stuff done. So if you've just done a, a business presentation, and you're gonna high five your teammate, you're gonna be in a state of stress. Uh, that's still your autonomic nervous system is still fired up your sympathetic nerve. That's the nerve that's responsible for stress in our body, by the way. Um, and that's gonna lower our heart rate variability. Um, but also if we go out and do some exercise, we're gonna be in a state of stress. It's neither good nor bad. We need to make sure that we've got this balance to it, which again, we mentioned in, a, in an earlier video. So what's the flip side? Flip side is a higher heart rate variability. When there's a high variation between consecutive heartbeats, that's indicative that we're in a state of well-being. That's indicative that our body's in a state of recovery. Now we've just, just to quickly, uh, very quickly, just sort of say what that kind of happens physiologically in your body. When we're in a state of stress, all our blood is re-diverted from our vital organs, things such as our digestive system, is diverted away to our muscles to prepare us for fight or flight. When, we're, when we have a higher heart rate variability, when we're in a state of well-being, the blood returns to our digestive system. That means now we can effectively process our food and get maximum nutrients out. Uh, the uh, further effects are um, a flourishing immune system. We're better off, we're better able to fight off infection when we have a higher, higher heart rate variability. The nerve from the autonomic nervous system that's employed here is called the parasympathetic nerve. Remember the sympathetic nerve is for stress. The parasympathetic nerve, that's actually the nerve in your body that is responsible for well-being. So in terms of what can our heart tell us, it can literally tell us whether our body is in a state of stress or in a state of well-being. Pretty useful to know and understand. So most people ask me the question, well, why, why do you have a high heart rate variability if you've got a state of well-being? Um, why is it good to have a high heart rate variability? Um, well, to answer the first question, why does it happen? Because this is a phenomenon. phenomenon. I can never say that word right the first time around. <laughs> um, but it is. Um, one explanation as to why high heart rate variability is indicative of well-being is because of our breath. Now, we've known this in one guise or another, one guise or another, for thousands of years. Um, the Far East uh, would, would, would incorporate Buddhism, would incorporate meditation, and so on. We're now really starting to take hold of this in the Western world, things like mindfulness, meditation itself. Um, starting to understand that there's this link between our breath 
and a body. And the, uh, an actual specific answer to that is this. When you breathe in, there's a slight micro increase in your heart rate. When you breathe out, there's a slight decrease in your heart rate. This causes a variation which increases your heart rate variability. So just as a, a starter for 10 in terms of how can I start to reduce stress in my life if I'm feeling particularly stressed, this is to say something that everyone already knows. Sit quietly and take a few deep breaths. Ever heard that saying before, Brendan? Just yep, take many a breath. Times. Of course you have. This is what it's doing. It's increasing your heart rate variability. We can actually impact by our behavior, we can impact the stress levels in our body just by breathing. So, so how do we actually measure this? So what we do at Cognacity is we've partnered up with a, with a firm called First Beat. Now First Beat are one of the leaders in data analytics uh, in terms of heart rate variability. Um, effectively, what, what, um, what the, the device that we use from First Beat is called the Bodyguard 2. And we can see it in this image behind. It's a small device worn on the chest and you wear it for three days consecutively. What happens over the course of those three days is it's constantly monitoring your heart beat. And it's picking up all this data around the beat by beat differentiation, the variation between consecutive heartbeats. Now, as you can imagine, the differences that we're looking for are so infinitesimal. They're so minute, it's by the millisecond. This is why heart rate variability read from a watch, um, it's quite hard to rely on its accuracy. Um, even with things such as Garmin and the Apple Watch, you ultimately, can you, from a wrist-based measurement, can you really detect those beat by beat differentiations. Well, we kind of jump over that by measuring directly off of the chest. So <clears throat> it's a small device, worn for three days. You use little electrodes, similar to if you've ever had an ECG, um, and um, you wear it including while you sleep. So we kind of already covered how it, how it works. It, uh, it measures heart rate variability. Uh, there's also a pedometer in it, so you're able to clock how many steps you make, and there's some algorithms that allow us to kind of extract some further information, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, so why do this? Well, firstly, why a first beat device? Well, first beat are the data analysts, uh, anal analytical platform that's used by all of the risk-based devices now. So things like the Garmin watches, um, we've got all sorts of different brands that use first beat technology. They're effectively the gold standard now um, in, monitoring, in monitoring heart based uh, activity to, to, um, uh, to, to pull out this sort of data. Um, so why use it? What's the, we're kind of coming towards the purpose here why we're going to want to, um, why perhaps undergoing a measurement like this might be useful. But ultimately, you'll produce a report. A report at the end of your measurement tells you the specific events during the course of your day that have caused you the greatest stress, the specific events that have given you the greatest sense of well-being, the specific impact on your body from your exercise, you ever want woken up having done like a swim session the day before and thought, I wonder if that actually improved my fitness? Um, or I wonder like, did, did I really work hard enough? Well, this actually tells you, it specifically tells you. And perhaps most interestingly of all, it'll tell you the restorative nature of your sleep. It'll tell you specifically how well you sleep. The gold standard in recovery and well-being. The majority of people report not sleeping well. I think it's, it's something like 70 something percent of people report not getting enough sleep. Um, this report not only will show you what's actually happening when you go to sleep, but it will be a strong indicator as to the specific behaviors and the activities over the course of your day, which may have contributed to it. We may actually start to be able to answer some questions as to why your sleep isn't as well as it could, it isn't as restorative as what it could be. 
So <laughs> I threw this in there because I thought it would be uh, interesting just to look at a live assessment. And I thought, well, I, I can't share any of my clients because of um, confidentiality. So I thought I'd just throw one of mine in. <laughs> so I, I did an assessment. Uh, this one actually is from last year. Um, so this is basically what it looks like. This is one day of your three-day assessment. And this is kind of what, what pulls up. So this bar in the middle, running from left to right, is a 24-hour period. Over the far left, that's when you've woken up in the morning. And on the far right is when you've woken up the following morning. We can see uh, at, the, at the bottom, there's a, like a bar running from left to right. It, it's brown to start off with, and there's a gap, and then it becomes purple. And if you can see that there, Brendan, uh, the purple bar is when we've gone to sleep. That's the, the purple bar running horizontally at the bottom. Um, the brown bar is actually when I've, I've been at work. But here's the interesting thing. Wherever you see a red vertical bar on the, on the, uh, on the graph, that's my, my nervous system has been in, in a sympathetic response. It's been in a stress state. I've been in fight or flight. So you can see over the course of my day, I've spent pretty much all of it in fight or flight. Green is indicative that you've got a high heart rate variability and you're in a period of, and you're in a state of well-being, in a state of recovery. Now, ultimately, what we're trying to look at is, is there balance between these two? And we can start to pinpoint the specific activities that may have caused me to be out of balance. And the one that sticks out here, because the higher, the taller these bars are, we can see bang in the middle of the page, there's a little journal entry there where I've gone for dinner, drinks, networking. And that, the combination of that alcohol and whatever that networking event was, that's been the greatest stress, stressful event of my day. So much so that it's actually impacted my sleep. Does that make sense? Can you kind of understand well, that there, Brendan? I can follow it, but I'm surprised how it's created so much stress and networking event for, for you, particularly if you're not the speaker. Um, there's also one question about 10 o'clock that's a bit of green so why is 10 o'clock green yeah I'm glad you I'm glad you've highlighted that so ultimately where we're looking in order to get enough balance into our day we want to see or an easy way to do that is to have daytime recovery so daytime recovery would be reflected as a green bar in the middle of the day so there I've had a coffee, uh, travel, walk and train. So I've had a coffee, most likely at a coffee shop. And that probably would have been the back end of that time where I've just sort of relaxed, chilled out. I might have put my laptop away and I'm, I'm just sort of relaxing and my, my, my autonomic nervous system has flipped from sympathetic into parasympathetic, flipped from stress into recovery. And it's reported that in the report here as a as a uh, as a recovery activity um so <clears throat> here if we just drop down we can see that we've got a score built out for each section so you can see under the stress and recovery that i've got a score of 35 out of 100 now whilst that's moderate it's not particularly good really so where i'd really want to kind of be looking is to if I'm gonna to go to a dinner, drinks, and networking event in the evening, I now know from having seen this report that it's gonna impact my sleep. So I'm probably gonna to want to build in some daytime recovery leading up to it or the day after in order to top my resources back up. Well, why, why do you think it creates so much stress though, Richard? So dinner, drinks, and networking, I mean, so this is the first of, First of May 2019. Um, so it's going back quite a while. So now you're testing my memory. Mm. Um, I didn't speak at this event. I spoke at an event um, in the middle of the day. There was a presentation there, uh, but that was kind of okay. Um, it's very likely to be the reason that the stress response has been so high is very likely to be the alcohol. And, and the impact of alcohol can really be that instant. Yes, it can. Um, 
what we'll usually see um, is our goal will have uh, uh, an immediate um, impact on our heart rate and our respiratory rate um, and, and, and ignite our stress response uh, or at least accelerate it um, or accentuate it. So that's, that's not surprising at all to see that. Um, and then we can almost see how, how the alcohol has kind of come out of the system as I've got, I've gone to bed, it's still, at, it's still in play. So don't forget here, at midnight, my nervous system, my autonomic nervous system is in a state of stress. My body's in fight or flight response, but I'm asleep. I'm, I'm, I'm asleep. I've drifted. How many people would use a phrase such as, oh, a, 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 a drink in the evening helps me drift off to sleep? Well, it, often it does. It's very easy to fall asleep with alcohol very unlikely you'll be having restorative sleep though. Um, it's, it's quite quite typical to see that in the, in these reports. Uh, Richard, b before you work for Coconacity, this lifestyle assessment, the graph which you show, would you have done this when you played for London Irish, Leicester Tigers, Leicester Tigers? Yeah. yeah. Same, um, same? Yeah, so we use, we use first week technology. We use a slightly different um, measure, uh, measuring system because we we want to get the data uh, for while we're playing as well as while we're sleeping and so on so we, we'd be wearing a, a a more robust strap um and it would uh it would it would highlight some 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 quite slightly different metrics but still incorporating heart rate variability as well uh because it's quite it's obviously a very useful um measurement for um uh, for your physical performance at a, at, a, at a vigorous level. And clubs would still be doing that right now for players who aren't necessarily playing, but they can see their graph from a distance yeah. away remotely? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So the, um, the majority of elite sports teams uh, would, will be using, um, will be using a, Either, either this specific measurement device or a version of it, it's very likely that first beat will be the, the data analytics that's um, supporting them. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just, it's a gold standard in elite sport. Uh, this, this sort of data is just so important. How well you sleep, I mean, it's important to, for all of us, um, but for, for athletes, we really want to be understanding, right, how restorative is your sleep? What are the changes we can make to your evening routine in order to improve your sleep by the marginal gain by the one percent um because that's ultimately what we're looking for uh, at that sort of level um but what we find at the executive level so so incorporating the these sorts of measurement devices into uh, regular people say property investors um or anyone running a company um is how can we sustain our performance and um, how can we squeeze out that that extra one percent the marginal gain um yeah because ultimately that can that could be the the difference between between us reaching this level and reaching well, the the sky <laughs> um or, or at least our peak or an individual peak so you can see here there's also a, a score for sleep for physical activity as well again We've always run over time on these Brendan, so i'm going to try and just fly through now just to um to kind of kick off so this is kind of this is what a 24-hour snapshot should look like so good stressful events during the course of the day and um, some exercise here so blue by the way is indicative of exercise dark blue is vigorous exercise um what's interesting and i think i've already mentioned this is how, what is the specific impact that on us I'm seeing now so many people out running, biking, doing all sorts of exercise. Well, is it improving? Is it just sustaining your current fitness level? Is it highly improving? Well, this measurement actually tells you, specifically tells you, um, and, and offers suggestions as to how to tweak it and to improve it. So that's quite interesting from an exercise perspective. But what we ultimately want to see is by the time we go to sleep, are we flipping into recovery mode? This is ultimately what we want to be looking at. Because what we see very often up the top, these would be these tall red bars would be what are referred to as acute stress reactions. That's how stress is meant to be. Get stressed for a moment, deal with the problem, now I can relax again. That's an acute stress response. Right? Chronic stress is basically when we can't let it go. And it stays with us. Humans are very guilty of this. You're lying in bed at night and your head's just spinning. You've got one thought going over and over and over. 
you just can't let it go. And it's causing this, this bite or flight response. And now all of a sudden you can't sleep. Um, that could be an indicator of, of chronic stress. And this is what we can sometimes see. So this was, um, I, I pulled this out of someone who, d who d did an assessment last week. Um, even though they're at home, um, they're not really doing anything particularly major. Um, they're still working, um, but they're just, they're getting no recovery into the course of their day. And th this actually was indicative of that they're really struggling with COVID-19 anxiety disorder was, was what uh, we've, we've currently um, uh, worked out was, has been the issue. They're just so worried about what's going on. And um, we were able to get that person the appropriate help that they can just start to manage that anxiety in a more helpful way um, and be able to let go so that their graph turns more into something that reflects more of what we see above. Mentioned this slightly, so wh wh where are we actually trying to go with all of this? Um, so a lifestyle, uh, uh, well-being, by the way, 40% of well-being is determined by your lifestyle. 40% of your well-being is what you do over the course of the day. It's your, your lifestyle choices. Around 30% is genetics, and the rest is kind of a, a combination of uh, the environment, social situations, healthcare, availability, and so on. Um, but it's quite a lifestyle's a massive impact, has a massive impact on the quality of our well being. So, by, do, by undertaking these assessments, what we're actually looking to do is to pinpoint the specific areas that we can start to make little tweaks. The theory of marginal gains, I, mean, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the theory of marginal gains is if you improve everything in your life by 1%, every, every area in your life, just, just tweak it by 1%, you get a compounded rate of return over time. Would it be possible, Brendan, to improve every area of your life by, by just 1%? You could, probably do, you could probably do a much better job than that, right? Um, but that's, that's kind of what the theory, the theory is. Well, we can kind of leap forward with this um, by actually highlighting specifics because we're, it's all subjective. Everyone's an, a unique individual. For example, two people playing computer games. We've done this assessment. I've done this with two people. Both were playing um, a, a, a computer game called Call of Duty. Right? It's quite a high impact game. It's military based, lots of shooting and everything else. Um, what do you think their nervous systems, what do you think their nervous system was doing whilst playing that game? What would be your go-to? Well, it would be at a very high level, wouldn't it? So Stress. Yeah. That's what most people think. You think, well, even though I'm sit down and relaxing, I'm actually so engaged in this thing. I've actually triggered my stress response. And that's absolutely true. One of them, who played for like three hours, was just in this unbelievable state of stress the whole time. Albeit it is is it that the same, more or less, when you're playing rugby at top level? Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. Your brain doesn't know the difference. Um, that's why we do in pro sport, we, we do things such as visualisation. If I'm working on my handling, I can physically catch and pass the ball. I can also sit and imagine that I'm catching and passing the ball. My brain doesn't know the difference. It's still, I'm still practicing. I can still be improving the skill. But flipping back to um, the theory of marginal gains, the, uh, sorry, these, these two that are playing computer games, one of the other ones was in a state of recovery. He had big green bars and he was, he was playing for about an hour. I thought, that's, that's peculiar. Well, actually it isn't because everybody is different. What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person. Have you ever sat in a lecture before um, or attended a seminar um, and it might be someone saying, oh, if you just do this, then your life's going to be so much better. Uh, all you need to do is eat this. Diets actually are a classic example of it. How many diets have people started and kind of gone, well, this just doesn't, this doesn't work for me. Yes, I can see all these amazing testimonials. But they don't work for me. We're all different. <laughs> what, one, what works for one person doesn't work for another. So with the first beat lifestyle assessment, we're able to subjectively look into what is unique to you. What are the, diff what are the changes that need to happen for you in order for you 
the theory marginal gains and take and take your life from here to here during this period to level up during COVID-19. Um, and that's ultimately the point I was trying to make. <laughs> So, Richard, just one quick question, because I know we've gone over time slightly. Um, so, you know, the tool which you use, is that available? Do people have to come to you? Do they contact Heartbeat? And how different is it to wearing a Garmin watch, the data? Um, so, I mean, I've just flipped back. The, the primary difference is the reliability of the data. Uh, and the fact that you get a personalized report. So the way that we, um, the, the way that we structure first beat assessments is um, uh, we'll take, we handle the whole process. You just drop me an email and say, Rich, I want to do a, a first beat assessment. I'll, have, I'll, I'll just handle the whole thing. You get an invoice sent through to you um, and then you'll have another email. It's all done via the post. Everything's sterilized. Everything's very up, like bang on point with COVID-19. It's such an easy process. Um, you, you will literally just answer a couple of questions, uh, fill in your delivery details, and, think, and the device is posted to you, uh, and you receive it a few days later. Um, all the instructions are, sent, are included with the, uh, with the device. There's an email with some further instructions. Um, you conduct your assessment, and you send it back. Once the and assessment's back, you then get uh, a report sent to you but you'll also get a, um, a feedback session uh, with either myself or another um, Cognacity executive coach. Uh, well, we'll just very briefly, it's usually around 15 minutes, we'll just talk you through your report and highlight the areas just to bring your attention to the areas that you, that you really need to, to work on. And that's what we include in our, in our offering. Look, uh, I've lost my page on Facebook, so I was trying to share it into one of my groups. So I can't see if there's any questions i was going to say richard hopefully we can catch up next week possibly at a similar time as well yeah, uh, sure. which would be the fourth week in a row um <laughs> we have managed to share it on facebook which i'm delighted about so let's catch up um okay. on um well hopefully midweek next week um Definitely. and around what i'll do in the meantime time. is i'll i'll add a link just to some further information if anyone just wants to read any further about it um you can look on first beats web website they've got they've got a fantastic website with loads of information around first beat and the measurements and so on um we've got a bit on our website cognacity.co.uk but I'll, I'll include a little link to all of that um if anyone wants to find out more so look just a call to a action for the listeners if there's something you want me to address with rich specifically um do let me know um so i will look at those comments whether it's now or whether you're sending a comment later whether you're listening to my podcast or whether you're listening to my youtube channel um you know feel free to add a comment we'll read through the comments and that will help create the next session or sessions with richard so i just want to say massive thanks for taking time out this afternoon richard pleasure as always brendan <laughs>